Look, there's no way to sugarcoat it. 2020 has been absolutely devastating for most businesses. And I say most businesses because it's not all of them. Some that probably didn't need your help in the first place are doing even better than they did before. But if we're talking about the small businesses that make up your community and you believe that you can vote with your wallet, your wallet has possibly never had more power than it does right now. So when I buy anything, a ride, takeout, a vacation, I don't often think about where that money goes. But it really matters what marketplaces I use when I buy goods and services. I talked to entrepreneur Adam Jackson about the inherent problems a lot of marketplaces have nowadays. Could we begin by just, I'll, I'll just have you introduce yourself and say what it is that you do. Sure. Hey, I'm Adam Jackson. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a project called Brain Trust. Braintrust is a global talent network that connects people who build software, like designers and developers, with generally Fortune 1000 companies that need them and have trouble hiring them and retaining them internally. Adam, I'm I'm wondering to myself, I, I'm lucky enough to still have income, and I want to maximize the amount of support that I give to my community and the world when I spend that income but I, I hear that there's some problems with the models that a lot of marketplaces have, have built. So we see this play out in the gig economy is the best example. So the gig economy is about 10 years old. Uber was the first company, but it includes Lyft and DoorDash and Postmates. Uber turned a hundred million dollar taxi market in San Francisco into $250 million ride sharing market. So it expanded the market, but the other thing it did because it's hyper competitive real time and it incentivizes the lowest, you know, the people who have the lowest rates, reduce the effect of minimum wage. So it's an economic disaster, right? And why? It's because those investors needed to get returns. The, the, the taxation on the, you know, the fees are anywhere from 10 to 30%. This economic problem of web enabled to two sided marketplaces has been sort of a, a catastrophe in the building, in the making for maybe the last 10, 15 years. And this COVID lockdown, this sort of sort of restructuring of the economy we've just witnessed in the last six months has exacerbated, exacerbated it dramatically. Generally, you, you need to raise hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in venture capital to essentially subsidize one or both sides of the marketplace. Those investors need a return. And so what happens is the company led by the investors usually, will start taxing the marketplace in the form of transaction fees. What this does is it ends up creating divergent incentives between the users of the network who make their living on the marketplace and the operators and the owners of the marketplace. So for a lot of the spending I do, I don't really have a choice about where that money goes. Utilities, rent, that kind of thing but I do have a lot of choice when it comes to where I eat. And there's no one better to tell us about dining consciously than Eater.com's Jaya Saxena. Hi, Jaya. Hi, thank you for having me. So we're here to talk about ethics in dining. What should I be keeping in mind when I go out to eat? I think these questions have never been more prevalent because on one hand, eating indoors or even eating in, in close proximity outdoors is very much considered a risky behavior in the middle of a pandemic. But on the other hand, you have all these restaurants and bars who have gotten no sort of help um, from insurance, from landlords, from local and federal governments. Uh, who are really, really relying on customers to show up, um, order takeout, to, to sit down and order food. Um, so yeah, it feels like the stakes are, are really high right now, balancing those things. What if I'm ordering takeout? How many of the restaurant owners you talk to and the restaurant staff that you talk to, how many are thankful for someone like a Grubhub? And how many are like, they are uh, eating our lunch, so to speak, I guess? For the most part, a lot of restaurants owners see them as, um, you know, a, a bit of an unfortunate necessity. Certainly the boom in places like uh, Grubhub, Uber Eats, uh, Postmates, any of these services have allowed more restaurants than ever to provide delivery, which is, you know, one one extra income arm. Because of all these fees, 
it really takes a lot of work in order for that to make it worth it for that restaurant. Um, and so many of these services have things where, you know, they ask restaurants to do promotions or they say, hey, if you wanna be listed at the top of these searches, you have to pay us more or, you know, charge them for, uh, you know, there's a lot of hidden fees and things like that. The best thing you can do, honestly, is just talk to the people at the restaurant, call them, ask them, you know, what would be best for you. If it's calling you directly and placing an order and paying in cash, then do that. But if the restaurant says, please use this app, this is how we're doing takeout and this is what's gonna help us the most, then, then do what they say. And I think regardless, you gotta tip well. Uh, 20% 20, 20 was the minimum before this all started. And I think right now um, you really gotta go above and beyond that, especially if it's gonna be a relatively small order. Sorry, I've just gotta pause the show for one minute and do some online shopping. Ever since I started doing all these episodes either in here or up on the roof, I have to pretty much order everything online. So I think I'll just go to that online everything store that everybody knows about. Even if it doesn't support my community's small businesses, there's really nothing like it for convenience and price, right? Henry, let me tell you something. Who are you? I'm Mike Komarov. I'm the founder of Cinch Market. Huh, what's that? Cinch Market started actually to support uh, Brooklyn businesses. To help them, we built them a platform to allow them to team up together to create the same experience that you get from Amazon, but everything fulfilled by the Brooklyn stores. So Brooklyn has a huge inventory of almost everything, and we don't need anybody to bring it from other places, but it's not accessible for the community. You said you go to the everything store because you want it to be convenient for you, but how a single store like a toy store, a pet store, can create that everything store? So if you will go today to cinchmarket.nyc, you will, you will find tons of businesses from Brooklyn that integrated all their inventory uh, via their e-com platform into one store. And you can go and shop whatever you need. You, you will find today more than 30,000 items. Cinch has a long way to go if they want to rival Amazon, which offers, by their estimate, hundreds of millions of products for purchase. How does a local business get onto Cinch Market? It's very simple. They just need uh, to sign. When they get the order, they are responsible for the inventory. We pick all those orders uh, from the stores and we sort it back into the boxes where we bring to the customer it could be from three, four businesses. Do these, uh, do these local stores then pay a fee to be part of Synth Marketplace? They pay 9% to, to participate. Um, we work together with the community to make sure that we optimize all the costs to make sure that the model works well and for all the different players in the community. Do you have plans to open this platform up to different communities around the country or world, I suppose? What we do in Brooklyn and New York is, is we build the platform and the playbook for every city to join that movement. I can already see the comments now. Look. Cinch is Brooklyn specific, but let's hope that something like it spreads to your neck of the woods soon. Now, beyond spending and consumption, let's say you want to make a difference with the way you invest. But it's often hard to find companies who promote values that you agree with. Hi, Henry. I'm really excited to share how you can align your money and your values through impact investing. Hi, Morgan Simon, founding partner of the Candide Group. What's impact investing? Impact investing is addressing the fact that most of us have no idea where our money spends the night, right? That when we put our money in the bank, we think it maybe goes in the back somewhere or we invest in mutual funds and it winds up feeling extremely abstract. But really it's our money that's out doing things in the world. And those can be great things like supporting solar energy, supporting businesses founded and led by women and people of color, or it can mean that we wind up supporting private prisons and fossil fuel and industries that are fundamentally damaging for people and for our planet. Capitalism has a reputation for ruthlessness. Do I sacrifice anything when I start investing based on values? 
There's been numerous studies from Harvard Business Review to Deutsche Bank showing that in the long run, impact investors often actually do better. Because when we look at things like the fires that are raging and that are largely due to climate change, we see that some of the traditional ways of doing business actually cause long-term economic harm. And I don't know about you, but I don't plan to retire next quarter, right? I plan to retire in 20 or 30 years. And that means that I wanna be thinking about the long-term impact of my money. And I know that companies that value diversity, that treat their employees well, that treat the environment well, are ultimately gonna be the winners on the market. So let's say I've got some extra money to invest. Where should that go? I think there's three great ways to get involved with impact investing. The first is simply to know where your money spends the night. For instance, realmoneymoves.org, you can get a list of different community banks in different states that are really being thoughtful about supporting their local communities, supporting the environment, and at the same time, cash is cash. You know, that if it's an FDIC insured institution, you shouldn't have to worry about your money being safe. Second is to look at retirement funds, um, that often there's gonna be a social choice box, and if there isn't, that's something that you can ask your employer. Third is that if you're looking at individual stocks, you can be thinking about what is the impact in this community. You can be looking at resources like As You Sow that can tell you what's the social and environmental impact of that particular company or industry. So for instance, Black Lives Matter has an economic justice platform that's been developed by various activists and academics um, and gives great guidance in terms of how do we think about the different ways, for instance, um, that you can have incredible support or harm for Black communities through the economy. All right, Morgan, thanks so much for stopping by. Wow, what a realistic looking blimp. So we talked ethical eating, spending, and investing. Next time you open your wallet, give it a think.